Folks, welcome back to the World Extreme Medicine Podcast with myself, Owen Walker. In this conversation, I'm talking with Trixton May around his clinical experiences in Ghana. So Trixton re- recently took himself to Ghana as a second year paramedic student with aspirations to serve in a less fortunate and developed context than his reality back in the UK. In this discussion, we're going to explore the variety of experiences and revelations he had in this developing healthcare system. So Trixton has also written a reflection, Healthcare in Ghana, the Harsh Reality of a Developing Country. So this uh, this piece is going to form the basis of the interview and can also be found in the show notes. So welcome to the podcast, Trixton. Thank you, Owen. So Trixton, let's just kick off with just examining maybe why you ventured out to Ghana in the first place. I believe it was only a couple of months ago. Could you maybe just unpack it for listeners? Yeah, of course. Um, so as you rightly said, I, I'm only recently back. Um, it was a trip sparked by uh, an interest in wanting to see how other countries explore healthcare, um, how they tackle healthcare. Uh, something I'm looking forward to doing a lot more of. Uh, it was originally planned uh, to be a destination of Nepal, uh, which unfortunately got cancelled, but um, on the other hand, led to the experience that I had in Ghana. So, so um. Could you maybe just speak to some of the socioeconomic differences, Trixton, that, that you found out in, in Ghana and, and maybe unpack those? Definitely. Um, I think the biggest differences I noticed was um, how wealth determined um, a lot of what went on around Ghana, um, whether you had access to health care, whether you had access to clean water, food, housing, education, um, and how that had a direct link to um, deprivation later on um, and limited chances. Um, some some key different examples I saw was um, in some of the real deprived areas um, how when we visited them I was with one friend at one point who had um, hand sanitizer and we had accumulated a, a bunch of children around us all holding their hands out uh, mesmerized by hand sanitizer and, and enjoying putting it on and they were just so overwhelmed by something so small to us that was so so big to them so could you maybe speak to some of the wider cases of social deprivation that you saw out in your time there in uh, in Ghana? Yes, um, I think some of the biggest differences um, was some of the people who were coming into ED, um, such as children um, who weren't accompanied with parents, uh, looking after uh, their own health care needs, um, looking at the differences between those who unfortunately would have grown up um, without um, access to education, um, English was quite a, a language pushed to be spoken. Um, a lot of the signage in Ghana was was also in English, um, and unfortunately there was a link between those who were who were coming in uneducated, who also were from a lower social class, um, meaning that their treatment was was a considerably lot less than someone who had the financial means to afford their treatment. So looking at the context itself, um, there seemed to be sort of a real triage of resources versus uh, versus need, really. Uh, and almost maybe sometimes re- in reading the piece, uh, quite an overwhelming need at, at certain times um, throughout all spectrums of, of ages and, and, and clinical cases. Could you maybe speak to some of the case studies that you mentioned in the piece and, and maybe how you dealt with those? Of course. Um, so... We had one situation um, where we had uh, no oxygen, um, a lack of diazepam for a patient who was repetitively getting himself into um, a a seizure, a tonic-clonic seizure, um, which left everyone quite on edge. And at first I noticed the patient and it was just a case of of going straight back to the basics, rolling the patient, making sure the airway was clear uh, and using what we had around us. We had... um, we had no medication to, to deal with the situation. We had no oxygen to administer to the patient. And also at the time, we didn't know whether only single pulse oximeter in the whole of the emergency department was um, to even get some basic vitals of, of how the patient was. Um, but it also opened up avenues to look into um, how far we can actually go with just using uh, things around us and our, our hands and our brain um, and what we can do with them. Um, I think in one occasion on that, on that job and, and how it, uh, I adapted our environment to, to deal with the situation was um, attaching some tubing from a nasal cannula to the end of a 10 mil syringe and using that as a, as a suction device by, by aspirating back on the syringe. Um, so there, there was constant having to think about what can be utilised to do similar jobs to things that we have so readily available in the UK. 
Indeed, uh, and it does force you to be innovative, I think, with, with the resources you have. And, and so maybe sort of looking at the context and the experience, Trixon, how has that maybe helped you as a clinician just to think in, in, in a different way, uh, maybe bringing that back to the UK? Yeah, massively. Um, I think, well, definitely. Before I went to the UK, I had um, this idea set in my head that um, a clinician is only ever as competent as their kit. Um, and I was very naive to think that because now coming back, I realize actually how far we can go with, with looking at, at the basics of healthcare and looking at what we can adapt around us to help best make the best of a situation. And I think working, carrying on in my practice and, and my studies in the UK, I am definitely going to look at my environment and think, how can I utilize this to, to best impact the patient care? So, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, when you come back to the UK, as, as, as you have done, I, I work full time in the humanitarian context, uh, both in Nairobi and Somalia and in, in the Middle East. And I think it, it really emphasizes the um, not only the innovation, but, but what we maybe take for granted within the NHS and, and, the, and the abundance of resource that we take for granted within the NHS. How has it reframed it for you coming back into the, into the NHS and maybe working in the NHS from seeing such a, such a, a resource limited environment? Uh, in all honesty, it, it, it's almost quite scary of how close we are to breaking point um, within the NHS. Um, you know, uh, there's been discussions about the waiting times at the minute outside ED and the effects of why that's so early on now and we're not even uh, entering winter, as as we've discussed. Um, and it, it does make you realise, actually, coming from a culture in Ghana, there's a lot of respect for the staff and we're seeing an increase of abuse in the UK. Uh, so it, it's, it is a scary thought to see what, what potential route we can go down if this abuse of, of our healthcare system carries on and the potential of what it could be like if we turn into a, a healthcare system that is relies on insurance or financially people independently financing their healthcare. So you spoke to, just speaking about cultural norms, actually, um, we were speaking just prior to this around the difference in, in cultural norms around primary carers, you know, the, the absence of nurses and, and the reliance on family. Could you maybe unpack that for listeners and what you saw in Ghana around sort of the primary care functionality? Of course, um, walking straight into the emergency department, I was confused because I saw um, people rough sleeping outside on cardboard. Um, it's not till later I realised they were family members of the patients. Um, their role was personal care. Um, they'd turn up to the hospital in either a taxi or their own vehicle. Um, they'd carry the patient into the ED. They'd be in charge of um, sometimes drug administration, sometimes taking um, the bloods to the labs, um, the, all the personal care, the manual handling. So they were very much involved in the, in the whole patient process. So just looking at the maybe the disparity in wealth uh, that we've mentioned, you know, the, 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 the clear disparity, actually, when, when you're in these contexts and the extreme poverty that you, you witnessed and that certainly I've witnessed. Um, what did that do to you when you saw the, the need and, and indeed the poverty? Because I, I believe you denote in the, in the piece people being turned away because they couldn't afford medical care. Mm. I, I'm definitely that. That was an overwhelming um, experience to see people being turned away for medical care, especially when it was mums being turned away for their children. Um, some horrendous situations, but it emphasised the importance of, of why we've got a healthcare system that includes everyone. Um, also, how important debriefs are, talking about these traumatic situations through with a team after you've witnessed something so harsh. Um, but definitely witnessing how, actually, despite so much deprivation, they're probably one of the most happiest population I've ever seen. Um, on one occasion I did see this this gentleman carrying his shopping back in his teeth and he had no arms or limbs and he was shuffling on his bottom um, and he was he was extremely happy and such a nice gentleman um, and it really made you sort of take a step back and think actually despite there's all these um, barriers and adversity into them just living a normal life they're actually a very happy culture. So looking at some of the differences in diagnostics and access to diagnostic equipment, um, in the piece you denote you know, uh, the, sort of the absence of, uh, in, uh, of in, uh, information and or equipment uh, from such as sharing pulse oximeters and other equipment. Could you maybe speak to the, the wider diagnostics that you experienced out in, uh, out in Ghana? Yeah, of course. Um, so there was one occasion where we had a patient turn up um, who was a female who was unconscious at the time. Um, 
what seemed when she first came in of something along some uh, stroke symptoms uh, and she was unfortunately left without having a direct CT scan which coming from a place with the UK where you'd expect to have that diagnostic equipment readily available with a team as you approach the emergency department to take that patient for you to check if there's a bleed on the brain or a clot there wasn't that sense of urgency there wasn't that sense that they'd ever get that treatment in time and often you felt like due to the lack of resources or due to the lack of diagnostic equi equipment you were often reliant on hope yeah it's very difficult isn't it especially when um there's a certain standard of care uh in in this context versus versus other contexts um uh, and seeing that in front of your face must be must be really difficult which brings me on to something we were just just talking about actually which is debrief and the utility and sort of the the, the necessity of debrief really could you maybe speak to the importance of debrief because i believe you saw some really difficult situations out there and 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 sort of uh needed the needed debrief at certain times yeah uh there was a lot on the article that I left out. Um, the whole trip consists of seeing trauma at a level I was never used to in the UK. Um, deaths um, with a population that were extremely young at times. Um, I remember one occasion where we had a, a baby die um, and the family were all upset and crying around and the staff quickly moved them on outside the ED and got rid of the body quite quickly. Uh, and as I went over to the staff to sort of be like, oh, did that patient of ours and they were like yes yeah, it's dead and we all just carried on as if it was normal and there was never a discussion um and that was that was the first time i, I experienced thinking ah oh, these people were so used to seeing such trauma uh they don't have time to think or process it because i don't think any of us are born to deal with with seeing such extreme trauma um and definitely allowed me to understand how important those debriefs are because you'd often what i'd often get back at home in the evening and just not really be able to process what it was that I saw during the day um, and definitely promoted the importance of times in the UK where I've been able to speak to someone about a job. So absolutely and just reframing those those experiences and putting them into context actually is, is powerful from debrief and, and going around the room and, and, and getting that shared experience is is absolutely powerful. Um, could you maybe speak to uh, something else that you mentioned in the uh, in the in the article and just this prevailing sense of uh, of hygiene and sort of uh, and sort of a disparity of hygiene really so so maybe m maybe not so and you know that the lack of hygiene and could you maybe maybe reframe it within the context as in I, I i know you denoted quite a few different experiences yeah of course um so a lot of the equipment was reused um it was washed outside um it wasn't sanitized the best for reuse um often there was bodily fluids on the floor that would um, take a while to be cleaned up uh, and the majority of our patients would go on to have further infections linked um, and it wasn't that there was a lack of education to these infections um, it was more a lack of resources t to manage um, such extreme infection in an environment as such as that uh, there were occasions where you know we saw people who looked like they were going to vomit and instead of being able to give them something to be sick into if they were mobile they were told to just go outside around the corner in order to be sick which is something you you couldn't imagine happening in a, in a United Kingdom hospital. Um, there was one occasion where I was lucky enough to visit the schools with the healthcare team um, and educate them on some hand washing techniques and some other hygiene that they could bring back to their families and, and take on themselves. And it was nice to see the education there and the children so interested in, in how to be more hygienic. But unfortunately, the reality is when they go home to their deprived areas, they don't have access to the same soap or clean water um, or utensils we have to keep such high hygiene levels. So Trixon, you were talking about sort of having an innovative approach really and before and how you you have to adapt to the context really and, and really start to triage appropriately to the context and and look at inno in innovatively at adapting equipment. Could you speak to maybe some more experiences where you where you had to adapt and where you had to innovate? Yeah, of course. Um, was it on this podcast I spoke about the seizure situation I can I think it was the last one, actually. So you can start, yeah, yeah. Do, you do it again. It's okay. We'll splice it in. Awesome. Um, so yeah, there was one occasion where we where we had a, a patient who was continuously seizuring without um, access to oxygen, without access to diazepam, um, which uh, later led to us really worrying about this gentleman's airway. Um, there was only so many times we could keep rolling them over and manually clearing the airway. Um, and it allowed me to understand actually looking around us, looking at what utensils we can create, how far we, we can go with treatment. 
uh, we had uh, nasal oxygen tubing we could we could cut off and attach to a 10 mil syringe that we could aspirate to clear an airway and act as a suction device um, which really had to make you start innovatively sort of thinking because in the UK we can just pull an electric um, suction device off the wall and, and, and start getting on without really having to think about what do we do if that device doesn't work potentially. So absolutely, and and there's there's plenty of sort of local innovations you can you can make to 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 adapt to the context. Uh, was there anything else you had to adapt to? Because I understand that that the oxygen was uh, was uh, limited. Uh, was was there anything else that was limited that you that you either had to adapt or indeed observed? Yes. Uh, so splints uh, was was a was a big one. Uh, a lot of the time that was cardboard whether that was pizza boxes, cereal boxes, whatever we could cut up to act as some kind of hard splint that we could then tie to to any limb was was what we, our equivalent of a splint over there. Um, I think our observation quit, kit, we had um, one of everything, a pulse oximeter, thermometer, which was just an armpit one, not even a, a tympanic. Um, we had uh, one blood pressure cuff, and often you wouldn't know where this was in the emergency department and you were all fighting over who could have it next and that your patient needed it more but had no idea about how critical this other patient was and and that's definitely brought out the importance of communication as well within a team. So Jason, looking at you know, this was a an approach you made on your own to this to this healthcare environment in, in Ghana. Um and you you obviously built the links up and, and and went out there um on your own with with building relationships um could, we, could you speak to the the experience as a whole and whether you maybe consider would doing something through maybe an organization next time or whether you indeed would go out again on your own um i definitely go out um solo travel was something i was extremely scared of um i've i've never done it done it before um but actually at christmas i've already uh, planned to to have my next trip so it's definitely something i'm going to look into exploring uh, more that's fantastic that's fantastic and and absolutely and uh, so as i work for an international aid organization a humanitarian organization i think there's advantages to both you know there's advantages to going out as an individual because you can have very much an organic experience there's all uh, there's also advantages i think going out with an international organization because there's prevailing security um debriefs and briefs uh, there's also a context to to debrief um afterwards and maybe a support network around as well but there's also but the, i think there's this pros and cons to both actually but you can can certainly be quite versatile when you go out on your own into into these environments did you have any support any wider support that you could that you could call on in country yeah sorry and i was i was quite slightly confused with the question i did go with an organization called work the world ah okay uh, i thought okay. we were meant solo as in didn't come with a group of people initially to the to the institution yeah, that's okay, mate. That's okay. Yeah. That's it. Well, uh, let me just uh, ask that question again, then, and just and then maybe just maybe just answer it with the with the with with the organisation name. Of course. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, Trixon, what what is your thoughts about experiencing environments as a single clinician uh, versus uh, sort of a, a larger aid agency or NGO? Because I did believe you went out with it with with an agency, but you went out on your own. Could you maybe speak to the about the agency you went out with and and or your reflections uh, about going out again? Yes, definitely. Um, so I've already got future plans to go out again. Um, this time was with an organisation called Work the World. Um, and that was that was very good in the sense of we had that that security around our house to ensure that we were protected at all times. Uh, I think there's definitely advantages and disadvantages of different organisations. Um, next time for my next trip is uh, without an organisation, so I think that will be good to compare the differences between what it was having that kind of support, having that knowledge that the food and water you were getting was healthy as well, um, compared to managing on your own. And so it seems to have changed you as a, as a person and as a clinician. I think a lot of these experiences um, both change you not just within the context of your uh, of, of your professional life, but they actually change you in, in the context of your personal life as well. Could you speak to that and, and how it's maybe changed your perspectives just in a personal way? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think coming back to the UK, it was an understanding of remembering what it was people complained about whether that's not only to healthcare staff, but everyday things, you know, a service charge on, on a bill in a restaurant or the queue times being too long or the traffic. Um, and when you are surrounded by people who are so happy with 
the minimalistic lifestyle they live, it does start you make to rethink what is it that we complain about and, and why is it we're complaining about such such small things in the global scale. Indeed, indeed, absolutely. So just looking at the limited resources environment, uh, and there's this there's, multifactorial, I think even you denote in the, in, the, in the piece itself, it wasn't only the equipment, but it was indeed the drugs or the oxygen um, and the, the manpower and, and, and a few other things as well. Do you think that, because you did say before, actually, you know, the NHS is going to a very unique time at the moment, and, and actually we are facing our own version of limited resources as we go into the winter. What, what, what can you bring what, what have you brought forward from, from working in a limited uh, resource environment to, to this environment? Uh, I think the biggest thing I've brought for myself in my own, in my own practice would be the ability to, to think more diversely about um, what other referral pathways there are, um, what other opportunities are open for the best patient care. Uh, because sometimes the thought of maybe a five, six hour wait outside an emergency department isn't always going to be best uh, for a patient. Um, so what other referral treatment pathways there are, um, or, or even if, if a patient's critical, what, what can we use around us to, to help uh, best support the patient? So Tristan, just, just, just for any other paramedics listening to this that might be thinking, or indeed doctors or nurses in their formative years, so in their early years of training, would you advocate an experience like this? And if so, um, why would you advocate it? Definitely. Uh, I think exploring and experiencing healthcare in a different environment definitely changes the type of clinician you are when you return home. Uh, I think it really emphasises how far hope can go, how far reassuring a patient can go when, when there are limited resources, uh, and definitely widens and matures who you are as an individual and humbles you to understand how privileged we are to have what we have. So are there any final revelations, Trixton, in your minds that you'd like to convey to clinicians listening to this around exposure to a, a low resource environment? Um, I would just advocate doing it. I think there's only so much we can talk through either a podcast or write on an article going into an environment as such that's different to what you're used to is the best way to really understand uh, how to adapt and be a better clinician, but also to understand how other people live their lives and, and how important that is that, that we're all... We're all humans. Um, we are all the same species and we should be there looking out for one another. I think that was um, the biggest takeaway from visiting Ghana was everyone there was either called an auntie, an uncle, a brother or a sister. Um, and it's not because you were biologically related, but it was a respect that that all of you were were deemed to be of the same, no matter colour, no matter race, religion. You were all uh, as one. You're all a team and we all did everything that we could to help the person beside us. Um, I think... One beautiful example of that was um, once I was on the, the side of a pavement um, and a taxi was driving past with two occupants who got out and insisted that I got in and took their taxi, um, which it, it, it would um, seem rude, rude to them if I was to decline the offer. So at first I was obviously quite abrasive to the idea, but um, they insisted that I got in and it being showered with such kindness in an area so deprived was definitely eye opening. Mm. It seems actually in, in areas um, of social deprivation, the less people have, the more generous they, they generally are. They, they, it seems to be my experience as well that, that people cl- hold quite lightly to material objects when, when that's, it's, they're, they're not in abundance. And it sounds like it was the same, uh, same in Ghana. Definitely. So, Trixon, thanks so much for uh, just joining me on the podcast and just just re- re- recalling and and re-experiencing your 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 thoughts from the um, from from Ghana. Um, we'll, we'll put we'll attach the uh, the article to the show notes so people can read through it and look at the different subcontexts, the, the different case studies which you uh, which you unpack, which is which are absolutely fascinating actually. And we'll also put a link to the organisation as well if anyone wants to potentially apply to. To, uh, to go away with that organisation. Um, so any uh, any final thoughts from you, Trixton? No, just thank you for your time, Owen. All right, thanks. Thanks, mate.